I don't have a lot of slides, actually. This is my only slide. <laughs> it's a good thing, I think. So um, I agreed to, to be here and to talk about how the adoption of my children influenced my ideas of capitalism and, and business. And I, I agreed to do this talk before I actually thought about it. <laughs> um, <laughs> And this has been, it's been tricky, it's been tough. And uh, so please bear with me, and that's one of the reasons why there are no slides. <laughs> so I want to talk about two things, uh, sort of two personal journeys that I, I've gone through. I have two adopted children, hence two stories. Um, these are, you know, journeys of self-discovery that I wasn't expecting to take. Um, and they sort of profoundly changed my sort of views on myself and, and business and how I think that, you know, the world can be a better place. So, the first story is about my daughter. Um, she was adopted from Guatemala in 1999. And uh, for those of you who don't know, that's in Central America. Um, I didn't know a lot about Central America before this. And uh, that was a, an amazing experience. The second journey is more of an inward or introspective kind of journey that I went on. Um, and that happened after the adoption of my son in 2003. So, I'm 47 years old. Um, I've been married to my wife for, well, now 20 years. We've been together for about 25 years. And in the mid-90s, we decided that we were going to have a family. And, uh, well, it didn't work out quite as we thought or expected it would. And we were unable to, you know, conceive our own children naturally, and we ended up embracing adoption as the way that we were going to have a family. Now, I don't know how much you know about adoption, but it's a, it's a difficult process um, on the adoptive parent side. There's a huge amount of scrutiny. There are a lot of courses you have to go through. There are background record checks. There are prior contact checks. There are a number of checks, you know. Lots of blood was given. And, you know, it's sort of one of those things you think about you know, when you're cynical at the moment that if every parent had to go through the same amount of stuff that an adoptive parent had to go through, there'd be an awful lot less children in the world. Because <laughs> nobody, nobody would, you know, put up with that kind of stuff. <laughs> but, it, but it's an awesome system. And, you know, it, it, it's changed over the years. Uh, adoption is, is controlled by the birth mom or the birth parents, but typically it's the birth mom. And that's the way it should be. I mean, she's making a huge decision about what she's going to do with the child that she's carrying. Um, so from the adoptive parent's point of view, it, it sucks because you have no control. Um, birth parents, birth moms are given proposals of potential adoptive families and they, they hold all the cards. So as an adoptive parent, that means that you, know, you can get the call and say, woohoo, I'm a parent today or never. So Imagine, you know, back in the 90s, I mean, I had a pager, and the cell phones weren't that <laughs> prevalent, and uh, you're just waiting for the, for the phone to ring all the time, in which, you know, being a type A kind of entrepreneurial personality really kind of blows. So, we were given the, uh, the opportunity to adopt a, a child from Guatemala, and we were totally excited. We were, Ooh, this is awesome. Holy shit, what does this mean? Because um, we didn't know very much about Guatemala. I mean, it's in Central America, right? Okay, fair enough. It's got hills, volcanoes. Um, it's also had you know, a history of civil war, um, a lot of conflict. We didn't know what we were getting ourselves into. And of course, being an adopted situation that we were faced with, we had 72 hours to decide. Here's this wonderful, beautiful Guatemalan girl. You've got three days to say yes or no. So we said yes, because, well, what else are you going to say? <laughs> you know, we flew to Guatemala. We lived there. Um, we decided to move in. We immediately fell in love with her. It was one of the most amazing experiences of our lives. You know, I mean, I said we, 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 we moved there. Typically, adoptive parents come when all the paperwork is done. Um, in our case, it took seven months for the paperwork to be completed, and we decided that we wanted to be with our daughter <coughs> for every possible moment, and we lived there. Well, my wife lived there. I, I commuted back and forth. I still had to work. 
Um, and that carries a lot of risks because at any point during the time, you know, the adopted mom can say, eh, change my mind. You know, um, the Canadian government, Guatemalan government can say, eh, paperwork's not in order. And, you know, you run the risk of having your heart broken and, you know, remaining childless, which really would, would suck. So that's why most people don't do that. So we had this fantastic experience in Guatemala and then when we came back to Canada we spent a lot of time thinking about what, what are we going to do with this. Um, my background is in technology, um, usually starting and selling high-tech firms. My wife's a, a graphic designer. I did that for a lot of years, so did my wife. We wanted to do something that was, I don't know, it seemed to be a bit more meaningful. Um, and it's hard to put in words, but we're really quite taken by the Guatemalan people and the whole experience that we had gone through. I mean, Guatemalans are quite poor. Actually, they're very poor. And, you know, the more I looked at it, the, the, the more that they've been exploited by people. Um, and it, it breaks your heart. But, you know, our experience there, I mean, we were safe. We had an awesome time. The people were happy. They treated us with respect. They're amazingly compassionate. And, you know, I can't see, say anything better about the people or the country. Um, they have an awesome history. And anyway, we were smitten. So that was in 1999. My daughter's now 13. I won't talk about that. She's a teenager. Like, holy crap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know. Um, but, you know, in 2003, we started Ethical Bean Coffee because we thought we could do something different. You know, hey, why not treat people fairly? Why not have a fully transparent organic model? Um, it's a good thing we didn't do enough research because <laughs> retail coffee, <laughs> just a little bit competitive. <laughs> but it came back to some sort of real interesting fundamentals where when we were in Guatemala, farmers were being paid 60 cents a pound for the coffee that they grew, right? Not very much money. And it was costing them about 80 cents a pound to produce that coffee. They're only getting paid 60 cents. So, oh, okay, you're really poor and you're getting poorer. And here I am being a schmo in Vancouver paying eh, up to 15 bucks a pound for coffee. And that just seemed bizarre. I mean, how, how, how does that work? I mean, hmm, there's got to be some money in there somewhere. And yeah, yeah, there is. And it came down to a couple of sort of things like, it's, it's really easy when people are sort of out of sight, out of mind. Um, you can kind of forget about them. And the fact that, you know, people in Central America or any of those coffee producing world, nations in the world, you know, if you don't think about them all the time, it's kind of easy to forget that, you know, they're people too. And they have lives and they have wants and they have desires and they're just awesome. So we thought, you know, treating people fairly and making sure that they're paid a living wage would be a good thing to do. So that's why we started Ethical Bean. You know, 100% fair trade and organic. Um, a couple other things we learned was, holy crap, in a lot of these countries they use banned pesticides. You know, we can't sell them to Canadians because nobody will buy them. We have laws against that. But DDT is still used in a lot of the developing world. And that's just wrong. And the idea of fair trade is important, but it also needs to be independently verified by third parties, otherwise you have, you know, schmucks like me saying, hey, I pay everybody fair, it's all good. You know, go buy more stuff. So verification was really important, and that, that, that took us four years to figure out. And then we got really smart and decided to adopt another child. <coughs> and that was in 2003. Same time we started Ethical Bean, because of course you want to have a newborn and a new business at the same time. <laughs> I have no idea. That was just the stupidest thing going, but we did it. <laughs> and, you know, my son Sam, he's, uh, he's from Texas, great state of Texas, from sort of, uh, I guess, Mexican-American heritage. He's a fantastic dude. And uh, he, unfortunately, didn't have quite the sedate upbringing that his daughter, or his sister did. Um, he was born a month premature. That's not easy. Um, there were certainly some issues, particularly as an adoptive parent going to Texas and then taking responsibility for a child, and then all of a sudden they give you the bill. 
like holy crap. Do you know that it costs about $14,000 a day to put a child in an incubator? We were lucky because um, Sam's birth mother had Medicaid. Otherwise, that would have cost us like $50,000. And what are you going to say? No. Um, but moving forward, Sam was colicky. You know, he, he didn't seem like other kids. Um, he was more aggressive. He had problems concentrating. He was easily distracted and he didn't listen. Now, all parents say their kids don't listen. Well, we think Sam didn't listen as much as other kids could. And, you know, trying to be a good parent, we read a lot of books, which basically is code for me saying that my wife read a lot of books <laughs> and she told me things that I should, should read. <laughs> and, and for the most part I did. I remember reading a book on attention deficit disorder, or ADHD, and it was a real watershed moment for me because I read the book and went through the checklist and I went, holy shit, this is me. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, it's all great, you know. <laughs> but it, it was it was like a total like whoa, whoa holy crap because um, I've struggled with these issues for my whole life like you know, shiny bubble better go over there um, procrastination I mean I hate to tell you but I prepared for this um, oh about three hours ago and it, and it wasn't for for lack of people telling me that you need to do this I just can't sometimes. Um, but it made me think about a lot of things. So I ended up going down the, the rabbit hole. I got a formal diagnosis. I take medication. Um, but ultimately, it's been a huge sense of relief for me to understand that you know people are different. I, I never gave it any thought. And then that also got me thinking about people around me. So you think about friends, family, employees, because now I have a business. Um, that's always the, the curse of any diagnosis or anything, that everybody becomes a, an amateur psychologist, psychiatrist. <laughs> I guess I call her psychiatrist, I can't dispense medicines, but... Um, and it made me think about how businesses operate uh, uh, with this. I mean, I've been really fortunate because I think my ADHD gives me some unique benefits. And because I, I, I think differently, and that's worked Oh, come on now, really? <laughs> that's worked for me. So if I look, I've timed this. Um, no, that's not 10 minutes. Um, <coughs> ethical being employees is about 30 people, okay? So between three to seven and a half percent of the adult population has ADHD. So that means there's about one or two point something folks within my company that have ADHD. Okay, I'm one. I don't know who the other person is. Um, <laughs> which, but I think that's actually really quite a bad thing because why, why, why do people want to hide that? You know, um, are they scared of their jobs? Are they scared that people judge them or do they just not know? And if you look at other sort of mental illnesses as they're defined, I mean, over 25% of Americans, so that will obviously be less than Canada, you know, <laughs> will have some diagnosable mental issue in any given year. And in sort of ethical bean speak, so that's seven or eight employees. So what can I do about that? So the way I sort of look at it is, is if personal issues like mental illness and things like that can be openly discussed and not be shameful, that the world will be a better place. You mean the employees will feel better about themselves, have better lives, and you know, as a uh, capitalist slash entrepreneur, I will benefit from that as well. So don't, don't get me wrong. So I think that you know, businesses really need to encourage things like diversity, be more tolerant, and celebrate everybody's sort of unique gifts as they bring them to life and enhance those. So to summarize, so how adoptions <laughs> influence my ideas about capitalism, which I don't know what I was thinking when I decided that that was a good idea to talk about. Um, I mean, really, how hard is it for, for people and businesses to treat people fairly? Businesses need to be sustainable. We can't poison the earth. I mean, that's so short-sighted. 
businesses need to be accountable and they need to be transparent and be to held to account. We all need, and businesses in particular, what I'm talking about, need to be more compassionate, respectful, and tolerant of everybody that you know that they touch. And so, you know, businesses just really need to be a lot more human. And thank you.